I want to draw your attention to something that was posted on YouTube today. It's an interview by John Stossel of Reason TV with um, famous lawyer Alan Dershowitz, constitutional lawyer. I will link to the video below. It's short. It's about six minutes, and it's about one particular topic, and it, I think it'll blow you away. So what's happened is that a well-respected law professor and dormitory dean at Harvard University, Dr. Ronald Sullivan, who's a black guy, by the way, and his wife have been forced out of their positions because Ronald is one of the attorneys defending Harvey Weinstein. Dershowitz states the constitutional fact that all people, no matter how reprehensible their acts, have a right to representation and to due process. Dershowitz also makes the case that professors have all the more civic responsibility to take controversial cases that others won't. And Sullivan has taken on as his share of controversial cases of murderers and whatnot. Um, it is a civic duty to represent those who are going to have difficulty getting representation or who are considered uh, such monsters that people stay away from them. So Sullivan was forced out by a group called hashtag Harvard can do better using the common we don't feel safe with this man here. Harvard caved to this dysfunctional face of social justice that has become known broadly as identity politics and we could call these people identitarians. Identity politics is a low quality expression of the once powerful just and effective civil rights movement. Identitarians co-opt the high-quality social pattern of civil rights, but not necessarily to help the oppressed, although that's their stated purpose, but really to empower a small group of shrill activists. While true social justice practitioners work in the trenches of impoverished communities, often for very low pay, these activists primarily hark from the wealthy, privileged, elite class, and they seem oftentimes to lack a sense of reality to, act, or to lack the resilience to deal with the real world and this lack of resilience is being perpetuated by the overly accommodating attitude of Harvard. Jonathan Haidt, who I've talked about on many occasions for a variety of reasons, has written tirelessly of this problem, a problem which is also addressed by his latest book, The Coddling of the American Mind, how good intentions and bad ideas are setting up a generation for failure. The title says it all. As these students graduate and go into the real world, they're not going to do so well. They don't really have any experience of the real world uh, in this situation. And many of them are likely to fail. And with failure will come the end of the notion that Harvard and other Ivy League universities prepare you for life, at least the, the Ivy League universities that are succumbing to this pressure. So I think this might be the end of Harvard's reputation as one of the best institutions to obtain preparation for real life success. And I'm now going to both directly and indirectly tie this to Piercic. Piercic used William James' pragmatism to inform the metaphysics of quality. And in Lila, Fedris is reading James' biography. I too am reading his biography, but this is a different one. This is from the 2000s, but nonetheless. If you think Harvard has always been some great and reputable institution, I happened upon this paragraph last night describing the Harvard that William James attended. So William James goes to Harvard in 1861. Harvard College in the 1860s was at or near the lowest point ever reached in its long history. Charles W. Eliot, who became the president of Harvard in 1869, thought the college had struck bottom in 1853 the year he graduated. The great preacher Phillips Brooks thought the low point had come in 1855, the year he graduated. It was, in any case, a small and stagnant place. And remember, stagnation is a static pattern that is no longer taking in dynamic quality. Then and for the next dozen years or so, even in 1868, there were only 529 undergraduates and 23 teachers in the college. There were schools of medicine, law, divinity, and science, but they were not graduate schools, did not require or expect an entering student to have a college degree, 
had no admission standards or exams to speak of, and no written exams at all. Mirroring some of the low quality of Harvard in 1860, we know that this institution today is compromising their admission standards and academic rigor by caving to the identitarian mob. This is another expression of how these kids are being inadequately prepared for the real world. And as Dershowitz says, if they want much needed real world resilience, they need to get over it. So ashes to ashes. So later this week, I plan to um, address an old dialogue with Jonathan Verveke and Jonathan Pajot from, from a year ago. I guess it's not that old. But um, in this dialogue, I want to comment on it and tie what they say with Piercig's work. And I also want to update the Jordan Peterson Verveke difference. I think it's, Im it's, an, it's an important one. So I hope that made sense. And I will see you next time.